The federal government never tires in reminding us that Australia, seemingly alone in the developed world, weathered the ravages of the GFC without plunging into recession. That the combination of the resources boom and a well-regulated banking sector, not to mention the geographical dumb luck of our proximity to Asia, kept us afloat while the rest of the West went under. While Australia seems to have been immune to the worst of the global financial pandemic, it would seem that our relative prosperity has also inoculated us against some of the best and most radical social and political thinking taking place in the UK and Europe. Thinking spurred on by the meltdown of financial markets and strengthened by the conviction that our existing political paradigms and polarities are just as bankrupt as Greece. But, and here, as they say, is the rub, where is this new thinking coming from? Where is there left to draw political inspiration from once the stagnant wells of the progressive left and conservative right have gone dry? Tonight, three guests are in conversation with Scott Stevens, the online editor of the ABC Religion and Ethics website. And for them, it is the Christian social vision that represents a genuine third way over the bankrupt politics of the left and the right, beyond the welfare state and the supposedly unbridled free market. What is striking about this Christian understanding of sociality, of human community and monetary exchange, is not simply that it transcends the left and the right, but that it invites both sides of the political divide to join in a common vision, to work for a society that can be described as good from top to bottom, encompassing politics and political representation, the civil service and financial markets, right down to local community, schools and the family. Christian theologians like the three guests you'll hear tonight, along with Pope Benedict, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, and Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, today find themselves at the forefront of political debate in the UK, and it appears to be having an effect, with Prime Minister David Cameron and Labour leader of the opposition, Ed Miliband, both speaking about virtue, tradition, trust, community, the family, and relationships in a way that would be unheard of in Australia or the United States. Tonight's guests are Philip Blonde, the founding director of the Respublica Think Tank. Prior to entering politics and public policy, he was senior lecturer in theology and philosophy. He's an internationally recognised political thinker, and his ideas, best reflected in his book Red Tory, have shaped the agenda around David Cameron's big society and helped redefine British politics. John Milbank is Professor of Politics, Religion and Ethics at the University of Nottingham. He's one of the world's most influential and controversial theologians and has done more than any other to demonstrate the political reach of theology with his landmark book, Theology and Social Theory. And finally, Adrian Pabst lectures in politics at the University of Kent. He's a political theorist who once again brings Catholic social teaching and Christian metaphysics to bear on our global situation in surprising and provocative new ways. He has recently edited a book entitled The Crisis of Global Capitalism, Pope Benedict XVI, Social Encyclical and the Future of Political Economy. Your moderator for Big Ideas today is Scott Stevens. Philip Blonde, let me begin with you to, I suppose, help us get a sense of how we got here. Over the last decade, progressive thinkers like the late Tony Judd and more conservative intellectuals like Rob Roger Scruton have pointed to a kind of corruption that's occurred on both sides of politics, that the left and the right have abandoned their own best principles and have effectively colluded, I suppose, to debase society and politics and the market. Would you share that diagnosis? Oh, I think that's demonstrably correct. I mean, what what makes it such an interesting time to be a, a thinker in the European and American West, if you will, is that the orthodoxies on both sides of the divide are now dead and should indeed be buried. And I think that that's what creates the conditions for the sort of genuinely transformative and exciting new thinking. I mean, nobody really now thinks that the state is the answer to all of humanity's problems and nor can it or should it try to deliver on that. 
But by the same token, nobody thinks that the market, which was meant to lift all ships, deliver prosperity to everybody, has indeed done that. Indeed, what we see is that the state, particularly through the dominant welfareist approach, has essentially condemned increasing numbers of people to what can only be redescribed as serfdom, a permanent dependence on handouts, destruction of all forms of autonomy and activity. But by the same token, the right and the economics of the right, which promise mass prosperity, have actually given you minority prosperity. They've hugely rewarded those at the top. And more interestingly, I think they've cut off the ways in which people can own and actually climb the ladder, if you will. So what we've created on both the left and the right is a common form of politics. It's a conspiracy across the divide against popular sovereignty and popular prosperity. And I think understanding the fact that actually left and right have been very similar is, I think, key to unlocking the politics of something that would be dissimilar, that would be truly different. Is that because, do you feel, some kind of inherent betrayal within each one of the traditions or because they simply ran out of steam? No, I think something more subtle has happened. I mean, in Red Tory, I argue that essentially what's occurred is a very pervasive and corrosive form of liberalism has essentially taken over both traditions and has actually become the governing philosophy. And in a way, we in the West are ruled by a perverted and debased form of liberalism. And in Britain, liberalism first ran on the left and it ran along the side of, on the one hand, sort of a late 1960s social liberalism that made war on marriage, on the family, and essentially created a form of individualism. And paradoxically, extreme collectivism, extreme individualism create one another. And what you see in the right is we've had economic liberalism. Now, the type of liberalism that's governed us has actually conspired against majorities in the name of minorities. And so what you see is, for example, if you have a world just founded on individualism, very powerful individuals tend to dominate. Everybody else loses. And that sets up the conditions for the collective state to come in and pick up the pieces. But by the same token, if you just have extreme collectivism, what you actually generate is a form of surveillance state that actually becomes so oppressive people want to break away from it and when they break away from it they don't break into virtue they break into gangsterism mm. and just look at eastern europe so in a way what we're seeing i think is a complete break in modern politics and f both forms of modern politics that pretend to be opposed have delivered us to the same outcome which is massively disempowered socially and economically recreations of new forms of serfdom that are creeping up to the middle classes and increasingly a new structure of lordship and bondage and i think therefore it's the recognition of that and the corruption of both traditions by this, as I said, this perverted form of liberalism that I think really lies at the heart of our current dilemma. Mm. John Milbank, let me bring you in at this point, because it seems to me that one of the things that makes your work in particular stand out is that the way that you see the Christian social vision in particular being applied within the, say, political situation in the UK or Europe more generally stems directly from the way that you diagnose this particular problem. And I wonder, the historian Philip Bobbitt said that after the Second World War, there was a kind of post-war settlement that saw a transition from the civil state, in which the task of the state was primarily to protect borders and preserve society, mm -hmm. but that then there was this shift to the market state in which elected or would-be elected politicians, if you like, made a kind of contract directly with individuals to defend their well-being, to maximize their opportunity. And this shift itself meant that the state renounced the business of the common good and allowed the conditions that Philip's just been describing. Would you agree with that sort of diagnosis or do you want to put a different spin on what's happened? No, I think that that's substantially correct. And I think it's incredible if you go back uh, 50 or 60 years, you discover that governments don't think that their primary purpose is to promote economic growth. That's a, you know, a relatively new development. And it means that they have substantially been economized. And I think I'd probably argue that 
if while I agree with Philip, I think in the very long term trajectory that individualism first arises through the market. Initially, the state tries to kind of mitigate that to sort of substitute for the traditional functions played by community. But then in the long term, it finds itself just really in enabling these market individualistic processes so that if one can say that what characterizes free market capitalist relations is their impersonalism, then I think in the end that the state lands are reinforcing that impersonalism. It, it deals directly with the individual rather than trying to use welfare to support communities, for example. I mean, this was deliberately the policy of new labor. Then the only aim comes to be trying to enable people to compete more effectively. And it sees education as an instrument trying to equalize people in that way. It's often you know, hopelessly unsuccessful. And I think what's reprehensible about all that is that, you know, while we need some social mobility, we also need everybody to flourish in the, the various roles and tasks that they have. And for most people, that means they need fulfillment in work and fulfillment through community. And nobody tries to do that anymore. And, and to make this, you know, far worse, even the goals aimed at are no longer being achieved. You know, there isn't social mobility. Philip is quite right. You know, even the middle classes are now getting proletarianized. The gap between them and the super rich gets ever bigger. The whole thing, even in its own terms, you know, if you're trying to equalize individuals, seems to have sort of run into the buffers, if you like. And that's why I think the time is very ripe for considering something else. And I suppose my peculiar contribution would be to argue that the whole modern capitalist project is in its essence a secular project. This means if there's no longer common good, that's because we no longer have any sense of the transcendent and any sense that good is an objective reality. And for most people that is delivered by religion, I think. And once you no longer have religion, you have to have other sort of desperate mechanisms, self-regulating mechanisms put into place. In the long term, those maybe don't work. John, if, if I might, I, I'd like to just pick you up on one particular thing, because it, it struck me that a couple of months ago, Francis Fukuyama made a very, very interesting diagnosis of the North American scene, that much of what you've been describing in the UK, this vast discrepancy between those who are fairly affluent and those who are increasingly being decapitalized, it's sort of stripping away the possibility of a middle class of society. What Fukuyama pointed to, which I thought was very interesting, he asked, why is it that in the face of such vast financial discrepancy, why haven't we seen forms of left-wing populism in North America? Why has everything taken the shape of various forms of right-wing or conservative populism? And his solution is that it's because there's a fundamental lack of ideas, that the only thing that the left, if you like, has in its pocket is a slightly more affordable welfare state, but that the ideas on the left have all but dried up, and so there's no possibility for a kind of a virtuous left middle class to come about. How do you see that from the UK? There is another factor involved in the case of the US. I think from its very foundation, there's a sort of kind of dogmatic anti-statism that mm. you, you begin with the individual and that they have an insufficient sense of what the, the role of the state might be, you know, even if one doesn't want the state to override small communities and so on. So that there's a kind of fundamentalism there, you know, where one may call it the right, but there's a sense in which that is just another, um, you know, mode of liberalism, if mm. you like. And in America, the answer is always going to be I think, you know, there's too much on top of people. We've got to allow people to be individuals and flourish and so on. That anti-statism can translate into rich and robust forms of genuine communitarian localism, can it not? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there are some traditions in the Puritan legacy and the Southern Confederate legacy, but those traditions have been, you know, eroded both in North and South by sort of democratic statism in the North and by mm. the New South in the South that's removed all the genuine traditions, you know, coming from that Confederate legacy that was critical of liberalism. And maybe those ideas now only really survive in the Catholic legacy. But I think more fundamentally, Fukuyama is completely totally correct about the bankruptcy of the left, that if you read even New Left Review, it's supposed to be Marx, it's only offering a slightly more radical social democracy most of the time, mm. you know, it's a slightly extended welfareism. And this means that the left is stuck in a weird kind of Manichaeanism, whereby it thinks 
on the whole, you know, there's an evil capitalist beast that we're never going to get rid of. It's always going to be there. But we can somehow rein it back. We can control it or we can cream off money from it and use that to mitigate its worst effects. And it's obvious that you can't sort of defeat this beast. And so they have no more radical project, which would be about how, trying to have a different kind of economy, you know, of a fairer, more just kind of economy. They're not exploring the idea that you could have a free economy that was still an ethical economy, or maybe that ethics and freedom aren't so incompatible with each other as the main lines of political economy have always said. Again, it seems to me it's mainly the Catholic social teaching and related doctrines that are exploring this legacy. I mean, we do have an associationist tradition on the British left to do with people like Paul Hurst, mm. that people like Maurice Glasman are now trying to revive. That is an anti-statist tradition. But unfortunately, most of the left is totally bankrupt. And I think it's another reason why it's bankrupt is it's not prepared to consider what the grounds of real association are and that the grounds of real association always involves some kind of positive goal and some kind of leadership. So, again, the more thinking people on the left, somebody like Raymond Goyce, actually citing Marx's critique and Engels' critique of the Goethe program, are questioning this very dogmatic mm. egalitarianism or support for rights, you know, pointing out that even Marx thought that you couldn't have genuine community and cooperation if you didn't have some notions of hierarchy and if you didn't realize that all rights are always situated, they're correlated with duties, they're joined to a notion of a common purpose. And even Marx was actually quite critical of the French Revolution I mean, uh, in this respect, which is really interesting. The interesting thing mm. about Fukuyama's piece, which I think is remarkable, is that is he doesn't talk about what a middle class could do mm, to right. get ahead. His central thesis is that technology has been captured by the very proactive as well as innovation. And what nobody's discussing, which are the kind of conditions of mass prosperity, is middle class collaboration. And actually, if you look at something like Germany, the reason Germany is doing so well and now unemployment's fallen to a new low is way back in the 50s, it created the conditions for middle class collaboration around all the institutions and structures of economic renewal. What's remarkable is in the Western left, they're still trapped in welfareism and statism. And precisely because they can't think intermediate associations and how to collaborate to produce an effective form of capitalism, they're essentially dead. And I think that the interesting thinking on the right is that the right already accepts the need for social conservatism or social conservation. It accepts the need for family and local forms of social stability. But the more creative thinkers are saying, well, why don't we have a free market? Why do we have a rent seeking market? And what can we do to break it up? And I think they are more able to think intermediate institutions and associative capitalism, if you will, than those on the left. That's what's so paradoxical. Can, can I just say, I also think mm. there's a huge failure to think the issue of technology here, that increasingly the way we deploy technology is routinizing most people's tasks. So it, it's removing creativity and virtuous initiative and so on, also now from the middle classes. So we need to think about the completely different potentials within technology to enhance people's creativity creativity and independence. And this has now become an issue for the middle classes in the way it once also was for the working classes. Um, this is why sort of traditions about the dignity, the creativity of work, you know, coming from people like Ruskin and William Morris, are now of a much, much more general relevance. But there's almost zero thinking about this sort of issue at the moment. It's interesting that on, on the left in America, it's very clear that the secular liberal left sort of embodied in some ways by Hillary and Bill Clinton has completely failed and that in terms of ideas and practices there's absolutely nothing new there and in part the reason why the Obama presidency has been so disappointing is because it's essentially just an attempt to revive sort of Clinton economics and adapt it to the kind of post-crisis world not realizing that actually it's just about a bit more regulation it's just about a bit more spending to kickstart the economy but there's nothing there to completely transform the American settlement. And the only thing that's happening in America that's interesting on the left is actually the so-called new evangelicals, as Marcia Pali has shown, who are breaking away from their links with the kind of Republican right and are actually saying it's much more about communities working together, it's much more about mutualist arrangements, and it's not about the welfare state or the free market, but actually all these 
reciprocal associationist arrangements. And that left in America, if it can ally itself with those on the Catholic side who really believe in Catholic social teaching, I think you could see a new interesting alliance there. Of course, the trouble with the Catholics in America is that some of them are still very neoliberal and neoconservative. But I think the new evangelicals and some of the Catholics who want to take forward Catholic social teaching could, over time, transform American politics. Mm. The interesting thing is to look at the fact that actually all the recent genuine transformative thinking is being on the right. Now, what's interesting is libertarian aims are completely hostile to anything social conservatives would want or indeed believe in. I mean, basically, libertarians would be pro-abortion and it's hard to see why they would find common cause with social conservatives. And the interesting advances in Britain lately have been that actually everything social conservatives have been saying, not about kind of the kitsch ones, war on gays or one parent families, but the value of family has actually been demonstrated, is now shared across the political spectrum. It needs to be said that the really innovative thinking isn't on the left, it's on the right, also in economics. Because the failure of neoliberalism to produce an economy that works for everybody is actually starting people to think, well, what was wrong with that? Where, where does that failure come from? And there's been no similar analysis on the left. So I think if we're being sort of serious about what's happening in the West, it's why it is that a different source of right could make the running. And the sort, different sort of left that many people wish for is much, much further behind. That isn't a guide to the future. That isn't to say of necessity. But I think if we're analysing recent politics, that's where we have to position our analysis. And then the interesting question is, what role does Christianity play, play in all this? And where does Christianity sit? I'd really want to qualify Philip's analysis there. I don't violently disagree, but I also think it's a serious exaggeration. I mean, I think you do have to give credit to people like Duncan Smith for saying that, you know, things like the strength of the family and so on, the strength of marriage is a massive factor in poverty and whether people can cope and get out of it. And Philip's also right to say that the left has pretty well now bought that analysis. But at the same time, you cannot have a social conservatism um, unless it is allied to a critique of an economy that is destroying communities, destroying family and so on, as, as I think Philip totally agrees. And I don't see where that element has been supplied from the right. I mean, I think it's been supplied by thinkers like Bruni and Zamani in Italy, but they're essentially Catholic social teaching thinkers, you know, if some of these thinkers are allied to European Christian democracy, this is such a completely different animal, you know, there's a sense in which it's not even unambiguously right. I mean, the Pope is probably more to the left than he is to the right, if anything. And one could also point to the group most in France and French Canada, who've developed a sort of revival of a kind of Durkheimian style non-statist corporatism closely linked to a Mosian gift theory, which also figures in Zamania's thought. And they are most definitely on the left. On Big Ideas, on RN or on the web at abc.net.au slash Radio National, that was John Milbank, Professor of Politics, Religion and Ethics at the University of Nottingham. You also heard from Philip Blonde, the founding director of the Respublica think tank, and Adrian Pabst, who lectures in politics at the University of Kent, and they're in conversation with Scott Stevens, online editor of the ABC Religion and Ethics website, about a Christian social vision they believe represents a genuine third way beyond the welfare state and the free market. Let's return to the discussion with Scott Stevens. I would like, if it's okay, though, to take a couple steps back and pick up something that Adrian was saying before we actually get, I suppose, more specifically onto the issue of left and right versus the Christian third way. It does seem to me that so often, especially in North America and to a lesser extent in the UK, the Christian response to capitalism has broken in one of two directions. On the one hand, there's a kind of fear and re revulsion of the market, more of the left leaning side, in which case left-leaning dissident Christians do what someone like, say, Slavoj Žižek says, which is to constantly throw up more and more and more objections in the hopes that they themselves never have to be in power and make actual decisions. On the other hand, there's the kind of neoconservative adulation of the market. And Adrian, if I can just pick up something that you were mentioning before, I mean, surely what was most surprising about Pope Benedict's social encyclical Caritas in Veritate, Charity and Truth, is that 
he broke completely away from both of those responses to the market. In fact, he was very pro-market, but provided the market is re-embedded in actual concrete social relations. Yes, absolutely. And the reason why he opposes both visions, that of a kind of statist sort of social democracy on the one hand, or a kind of free market capitalism on the other, is because he thinks that both of these completely undermine the much more fundamental and primary level at which human beings interact, and that is that of civil society writ large, not the civil society of the 1990s, who was just concerned with rights or democracy promotion or sort of an, an abstract global cosmopolitan identity. No, a civil society that comes much closer to the sort of Italian, German, but also British and French legacy of association, of intermediary institutions, of local economies. And the Pope, in that sense, completely outwits all his critics, those on the left who want more welfare, who want more statism, as both John and Philip have already said, but also those on the right. And this is why attacks on the Pope's encyclical by people like George Weigel and Michael Novak are so misguided, mm. because they essentially equate American capitalism with the free market. But American capitalism isn't the free market. American capitalism is about monopoly, is about cartels, is about expropriation. There's nothing free market really about the American free market at all. This is why also it's far more transformative for Europe, for, for North America and for the rest of the world, because it simply doesn't buy into the old left versus right, state versus market dichotomies. Can I, can I just come in mm, quickly? Yes, please. I think that it goes even further than embedding the market in society in that what the Pope really is talking about it is a social market in the real sense. In other words, you don't just leave it to the pre-cultural conditions. He's also talking about economic transactions themselves embodying justice, so that he talks in the encyclical about how all economic purposes have to have a social dimension, that mm. a, a legitimate economic purpose can't be just about making money. It has to be about making a social contribution. He indicates he'd be prepared to revise company law, to write that into company law. This is way more radical than mm. anybody in the secular world is suggesting. You know, he's asking that economic exchanges be just exchanges, that they be about mutual benefits, all the issues then are about how far that's going to be self-regulated and how far externally. And my own view is that it will only work the more and more it's self-regulated, the more and more people see that business success and social contribution, you know, reliable long-term business success and social contribution actually go hand in hand. And what I think is really crucial about it is it's avoiding predetermination because it gives innovation to groups, to independent institutions that says you innovate about your good, but make damn sure that the good is really good and that what you're trying to bring about actually includes what everybody wants. And what's interesting, the Pope was ahead of the curve by some miles, actually. Yeah. And most economic thinking is now going in this direction, even That's at right. the level of governments, even in the United Kingdom, you know, whatever the merits or demerits of the present government, they are trying to talk about well-being. And the world we want might be might be the new agenda. And it, and what's remarkable, it's brokered by Christians and, and brokered by a Christian vision that is beyond current forms of left and right. Well, and Adrian, I, I do actually want to give you the first crack at this question, because I, I think both John and Philip have just said raises, for me, the crucial question. How on earth can this vision of a just and generous and gift-giving market ever take place? How on earth can we create the social conditions within which this kind of market could in fact exist, let alone flourish? The first thing to say here is to realize that the very conception of uh, human nature uh, that has been dominant is the wrong one. Either we, we thought of human beings as just sort of homo economicus, just concerned with sort of self-interest and profit maximization. And in the end, even other conceptions that look different are, are quite similar because then it's just about maximizing happiness or, or, or utility. But in the, you know, more fundamentally, the anthropological dimension has been completely written out of, of social, political, and economic thinking. The much more fundamental anthropological condition is that actually of gift exchange, but also of mutual recognition of notions like virtue, ethos, honor, integrity. And I think if you free 
human beings and human society as a whole from the sort of dominance of the market state, then you can give people to space where they can practice these things again. So the first thing to say would be to get rid of the concentration of wealth and the centralization of power, because that's a condition that characterizes the entire world. So you need to take power away from the sort of self-serving elites, and you need to decentralize in accordance with subsidiarity and open up spaces where people can, again, pursue what I think is much more in line with human nature, which is a, essentially a cooperative, generous spirit. Of course, you need guidance, and this is where a lot of thinking hasn't been done by left or right. You need virtuous elites. I want to come to the whole question of guidance by the virtuous in, in just a second. I'm, I'm very, very glad that you've touched upon that. Philip, just very briefly, you've stated recently, and I think this is another way of framing precisely the same question. You said, quote, we have to question whether the prime minister's right and noble ambitions for big society will ever be realized if we as a society fail to break with the liberal individualism and renew our civic ethos and our shared principles. Aren't you gesturing there to precisely the same issue? How can we create the conditions for virtue when I suppose those conditions not only don't exist, but have been hijacked by a completely antagonistic way of relating? No, it's the most interesting question. In, in a way, what you're asking is, how do we get there from here? <laughs> or to put it in another way, how do we crowd in good behavior and crowd out the bad? Mm. Now, what I think is interesting is if you ask ordinary people, is there good behavior? Almost universally, people will say yes. So first of all, we're in a situation where most people, wherever they are, think there's a right thing to do in a given situation. They may even have the language of relativism or believe in nothing. The point is we exist within a moral order that many of us tacitly acknowledge, but we don't have the practices to realize it. And the awful thing about modern life is many of our small choices, when aggregated together, create outcomes that we're quite hostile to. So we might want local stores, we might want a beautiful environment, but the way in which we shop and where we shop doesn't create that. But we know from things like fair trade, whatever your opinion on it, consumers will select for fair trade products because they want to select for outcome. And I think what we have to do is, is create communal rewards that individuals can gradually inch towards. And if they come together, they can realize. Now in social policy, which is what I do, we're always looking for ways in which communities can realize benefits that only communities can realize. So let me be very specific. Take energy, for example. If we just remain as individual consumers of energy, we'll always have high energy bills, we'll always get ripped off, and there'll be nothing we can do about it. If consumers come together in enough numbers, they can actually flip from consumption to production. Because what they can do is they can start their own micro generations, but they can actually even come together and create an investment plan for anything from incineration to wind farms to combined heat and power. Now this has been done, this isn't utopic, this has been done in various countries and it produces massive, massive rewards. So what that then takes us to is how do I as a policy thinker kind of foreground the communal rewards such that people will come together in, in sufficient numbers to select those rewards and realise them. Grounds for cynicism or grounds for reservation is the fact that there's many vested interests between the outcomes we want and the behavior we perform and those behaviors that we perform on a daily basis are in many ways create the rent seeking economy that adrian talked about john I'm, I'm going to invite you at this point to pick up what adrian was raising before that not only has there been a kind of fundamental breakdown in trust the fabric of civility itself within so much of the west today but adrian also pointed at a kind of crisis in political representation that this idea that our elected officials directly represent the people that there's something in your own term there's something politically nihilistic about that because it denies the fundamental way in which people exist in society can you talk to us a bit more about that i want to add to that i think two things the first thing is that um maybe beyond a certain point a lack of trust is dysfunctional e even economically if you see the people working for your firm as you, if you set them simply to compete against each other as a way of maximizing your efficiency, in the end it's not going to work and people are rediscovering a certain need for collaboration. But it's very difficult to invent that out of thin air once you've eroded all the fundamental sources of trust in our society. And then I think the second point is that maybe we stand at a crossroads, you know, 
maybe we go back to the centrality of trust. And here, Philip's right that you can have a, a kind of competition in honour, a kind of virtuous competition in honour, because it's absolutely not the case that we're by nature just self-seeking individuals trying to get as much pleasure and wealth as possible. What we primarily want, as Adrian says, is social recognition. So in a way, we need to augment shame. We need to shame the idea that it's okay just to be very, very rich and make no sort of social contribution. But and, trying to and yet shame that, seems to exist in a kind of corrupted form at the moment in the form of resentment. That's right. I mean, what we have at the moment is the idea it's fine to become as rich as possible and this is what we respect. And therefore, we have a totally non-accountable elite. You know, the point I think all three of us make, and maybe controversially, is that you can't get rid of elites and kind of governing classes, even if there's free access to them. The question is always, is it a good or a bad one? Well, at the moment, we've got the worst possible one. Whereas if you have a much stronger sense that representatives do have to actually exercise virtuous leadership, that they're not only, you know, expressing, as it were, the general will of the people, then you can allow much more interplay with real participatory democracy. Unless we go in that direction, there's going to be a new turn of the screw whereby capitalism will become more and more totalitarian. The only way to control it and deliver it, if everybody gets more and more individualistic, will be totalitarian mechanisms of both state and corporations acting in alliance. I think the idea of restoring virtue is what's so kind of transformatively radical. You know, we can't underestimate how our elite doesn't really believe in anything. No, it's you, know, <laughs> you know, we have an elite that those who win in our elite primarily are pragmatists, managerialists and technocrats, and they really don't really believe in anything. And this is what's terrifying in the West. And this is why the West is in the trouble it, it's in. Because only if you have leaders who believe in things can you shape alternate futures. If you don't really believe in anything, then by definition, you're kind of fine with the status quo. It's for precisely this reason that all three of you have come out very, very strongly in opposition to propose changes to the way in which the House of Lords is constituted. Now, for those of us living, I suppose, outside of the UK and who have... Well, we a want a different change. Well, yes, 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 yeah. indeed. You want a different change. The proposal, from what I understand, is that the House of Lords will come to represent something far more like, say, the Australian Upper House, a Senate in which those who belong to the House of Lords will be directly part of the elected and therefore yeah. supposedly representative right. process. But Adrian, you've written very, very strongly against this, saying that it actually flies in the face of one of the things that's actually keeping British democracy representative. Would you like to describe a little bit more just why it is that the House of Lords can in fact be representative? I think to understand that, that point, we need to begin with where we are, which is that neither the Commons nor the Lords are really fulfilling the function they should according to a mixed the idea of a mixed constitutional mixed government where you have monarchical, aristocratic and democratic elements, not monarchical and aristocratic in a hereditary sense, but in a sense of representing the one that is the nation, that the realm, if you like, and that is the, the function of the monarchy. Uh, of course, it's a constitutional one. So all the usual sort of uh, criticism about absolutism simply don't apply, nor is it simply ceremonial. It, it plays a much more symbolic role. And the aristocratic one is, again, not purely hereditary. The House of Lords used to be very much about the guidance of the virtues. It wasn't really to do with aristocratic privilege until essentially it was captured by a landowning class. Um, the point about the Lords today is that it's simply been filled with failed politicians or with people who have given a lot of money to parties, neither of which is very desirable, which is why we're not in favour of the status quo, which is why we want a different upper house, just not one that's elected. Because the idea that only an elected upper house is more representative and more democratic is complete nonsense. The House of Commons isn't generally democratic and generally representative because it essentially is dominated by parties who are themselves centralised and who only represent certain interests. 
mo more often they represent their own interests and not even the interests of their constituents. We also know that for governments to get majorities in this country, they need essentially to win, you know, more or less in 100 constituencies out of more than 650. The point is this, if the Lords were elected, then they wouldn't represent the people or society, they would just represent the executive and political parties. So what we need is a Lords that represents society, just like the Commons should truly represent the people. So we need change at both levels. For the Lords, that means introducing the idea of regional representation and also representing professions. And I think in addition to that, we need a strong representation of all the faiths. There is, if you'll permit me, the role of the devil's advocate for a moment. There is the immediate objection that will come from those who are used to hearing day in and day out the mantra about the separation of the church and state. Is this not what the three of you are advocating, a kind of transformation of the political, economic and social fabric? Isn't this a massive power grab on the part of the church? The question I'd like to pose more concretely to the three of you, how on earth is the church up to doing what you are proposing that it does without it simply appearing as if it's some great power grab? There can be a danger, you know, ever since the Second World War, perhaps, of a kind of bad faith amongst Christians. What I mean by that is a kind of rationalizing of the fact that we have lost power and influence to give this some sort of pious gloss, if you like. Mm. While I think it's absolutely true that real Christian influence should be persuasive and cultural, and in that sense, we need to sort of thank God that we're no longer in the wrong kind of power, maybe. But at the same time, that you can't entirely abstract the question of, sort of cultural influence from the question of power and political power. Pierre Manon has made this point quite forcefully. So, you know, pretending you don't want power um, doesn't seem to be quite the right way to go. It's much more a matter of the church is showing how free association, economic, pastoral care, the absolute value of the person. These are the three things that I think Christianity has introduced into our sense of the social and the political. I think they've been abandoned outside the church. So the church, in a sense, now has to take a much more directly political role than it has in the past. And I think this is already happening. You can already see this in Italy, that lay movements uh, like Focolare, Communion and Liberation are much more acting directly rather than through political parties, because if you're like, you're setting an example. And I do actually think that the debate has really, really moved on and that we can't any longer say, oh, it's fine to abandon lots of functions the church wants to perform to the state and to the market. On the contrary, that the church can't really form and shape and influence people if it's not a direct actor, a direct player in education, medicine, welfare, even banking, you know, the formation I of communities. Another way of saying the same <clears throat> point is something always rules. Exactly. The, there's an yeah. idea that somehow if we absent ourselves from power, power will go away. No, actually what happens is power coalesces around those who really, really want it. And, and the point is power is part of the structure of the human world. And to cede power is to cede part of your humanity because human beings... Are it's meant to cede to charity me. if yes. you're the church. It's yeah. to deny that charity it's, will rule. It's to deny yeah. truth. It's to deny gift exchange. So, I mean, Christianity is trapped in sort of the most pathetic 1960s type attitude that tragedy is yeah, somehow the path to righteousness and if you fail you'll get into heaven and somehow if you succeed this is demonic and so much of our training and so much of our church thinking particularly in anglicanism is based around a fetishization and rationalization of defeat what we have to do is to have a fundamentally different account of power and contest the other accounts of power and anything else is a failure to fulfill the christian vision because all power is an idea that something else ought to be the case and in that sense, that is when God's mission first kind of made itself realizable on earth, where Judaism was the first received religion that said the rule of the writ of the king is not final, that there's a transcendent order that stands above all secular authority in respect of which all secular authority must now reorient itself. And if the church now inverts that and says our values aren't transcendent or are somehow below other people's values, this is almost demonic in the sense of the version of the true order and I think therefore 
now is the time to, if you really want to challenge illegitimate power, you've got to talk about legitimate power. And legitimate power, in which combines the genuine distinction of good from evil, also involves the genuine recognition of all of what is good and what is evil. And the task yeah. of the church is to teach good and evil. If I could do a quick footnote to that. Yes, please. The point about the place of tragedy, and I think the discovery of the place of tragedy in modern theology is perfectly correct. It's best done by Kierkegaard. But the point about that is not that we are to become tragic heroes. On the contrary, we recognise original sin much more as the tragic dimension in people's lives, that they are in a way responsible and in a way not responsible, if you like to put it that way, for their condition because precisely of their historical legacy. So that I think tragic awareness has to make us treat people with far more compassion. But it absolutely doesn't mean that we don't try to transform that condition. I think on the contrary, the recognition of that tragedy is the precondition for forgiveness and reconciliation. And again, one can point to just how different the Christian vision is from the sort of dominant ideologies and other worldviews and even up to point other world religions, because it neither believes in a kind of ancient form of fatalism, that everything's been decided and therefore there's nothing we can do or change about our condition and it's the, the gods that make a decision or nowadays we might say that the state of the market but nor is it a kind of willful utopia where we sort of just sh through the sheer power of human volition bring about a different condition build a new you know the soviet man or or some such horror on the contrary what it's saying is that in the end that alternative order is already revealed to us in Christ, in the church, and that is something that we can help bring about, we can help perfect, even if it's never going to be fully realized in this life. But it's a vision that is not optimistic in a silly sense, but also not pessimistic or fatalistic. It actually believes that through charity, through generosity, we can bring about a better condition here now in anticipation of the, the beatific vision in the afterlife. But that is something which, if Christians give up on that, they surrender everything to the forces of evil. And the point here is not that we are repeating categories like that of the Manichaeans, that is some kind of perpetual struggle between the forces of darkness and of light and, and so on, but actually that we believe in the primacy of the good. I mean, after all, Plato and Aristotle realized that we have a natural desire for truth. This is inscribed in our human heart. And this is something which is both pre-rational and can also be enhanced through faith and reason. And sort of to take this from the metaphysical down to the immediately physical, most people want to do well by others, just to put this in very ordinary terms. And we recognise what doing well is, and we recognise what harming others is. So the great sort of problem, I think, with the modern age is we're deeply idealist in many ways. I mean, look at youth movements, look at peace movements, look at how racism in a very short period of time under 100 years has become almost unsustainable. These are great goods. But what we don't have is a way to realise them. And it seems to me that the church is really missing a trick here. If we can start to find ways that people can mobilise at a very local, very immediate level around the good, we really can change everything. In a way, this is what makes subsidiarity in Europe, big society in Britain, and all the other activities that are going on across the globe so interesting because it is a genuine third way. And just as a final question for me, it seems that this is precisely the reason why Pope Benedict last year came out and said very, very bluntly, the church must not behave as if it were just another lobbying group. And it seems to me that so many places in the West, perhaps not the UK, I'm not sure, but certainly in North America, certainly in Australia, the declining influence of the church within society itself has been inversely proportional to the activity of parachurch groups lobbying government directly. And it seems that Pope Benedict was saying that that is a kind of perversion of the church's proper activity, not yeah. lobbying government directly, but instead working within society as such. I think this is absolutely so profoundly right. And there's a lot of evidence that evangelicals are now declining in the US precisely because they hitched their wagon to a neoconservative foreign policy. This is completely true. If the church gets associated, you know, with campaigning simply on single issues, this is very, very dangerous, it's especially if there's some kind of fantasy that secular people are capable of the same recognition of the true natural law 
as people who recognize the grace of Christ, you know, the kind of fantasy that this ludicrous revival of neo-scholasticism in the US engages in. Of course, that's just about trying to be both American and Catholic at the same time, which may not really be possible. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very interesting that the Pope is saying something that, you know, people who sympathize with him, relatively Catholic, Orthodox Catholic, are in real, real danger of. It can be bad to go on too much about wrongs that a secular vision is never going to be able to redress. You know, for example, you know, attitudes towards procreation and so forth, these are embedded in a much wider vision. Unless people have that vision, they're not going to see these things. And also, the idea that you kind of lobby the state because you expect everything from an impersonal state bureaucracy is totally false. And, you know, the much more radical way is to develop the church itself as the true society, as the, the germ of the kingdom, as something that goes altogether beyond anything that can be envisaged by the political state. Otherwise, one lapses back into a kind of paganism. And Anglicanism actually has always had those two contrasting visions, you know, a very status vision that's probably embedded ultimately in British Hegelianism on the one hand, and on the other hand, the vision of the Christendom group that's much more about the church itself as the true social formation. The interesting yeah. question looked at, at globally is what's the dominant form of transformative social organization now in the world. So you look at the Arab Spring, it's masses, but what's awful about those is because they don't have a higher ordering order, they collapse back into various ethnic or religious or sectarian groups. And then we have in the West kind of putative popular protests and masses. But really, if we're honest with ourselves, what is the group or agency for genuine social transformation? And I struggle to find an answer. And the church hasn't got there yet either. People want that's holistic right. outcomes and the type of political right. cynicism that's generated is because we only have these single issue outlets. We're going to have genuine change. Let's start talking about what the new forms of association would need mm. to be. Adrian, I'm, I'm going to give you the final word. Whilst it's the case that no single institution at the moment is providing that reality, that roadmap to a different future. It's also the case that we have seen interesting, encouraging examples. I mean, we shouldn't forget that 1989 was an extraordinary moment where civic movements almost single-handedly brought down a totalitarian system and it, they didn't immediately replace it with a kind of awful neoliberal market system. It did creep in and unfortunately there are many lessons to be learned there, but they were after all civic movements. And I think the best of recent protest movements, whether it's aspects of the Arab Spring or the Occupy movement, is that it's precisely no longer the politics of the last 50 years. It's not a single constituency. It's not mobilizing the name of students or workers or women or minorities, nor is it doing single issue politics. It's not just about globalization or third world debt or the environment. It's actually about I suppose one would call the kind of the rebirth of the civic. That has tremendous potential. I don't think any organizational reality matches that as yet. We've seen how, as Philip has said, the Arab Spring can easily lapse back into just tribal and ethnic conflict or can be hijacked by religious fundamentalism, which is exactly what's we, happening we, we in Libya. We need something to hold it and maintain yeah. it. It yeah. needs an institution, yes, doesn't that's it? Right. Really? And Practices and habits. Yeah, yeah. And that can only yeah. be, at the same time, a strong presence of the church and other religious communities because they, paradoxically, are not just interested in their own interest, they in fact want to uphold the wider sociality where people form these bonds. That was Adrian Pabst, a political theorist who lectures in politics at the University of Kent. The other panellists were Philip Blond, founding director of the Respublica think tank and author of the influential book Red Tory. John Milbank is professor of politics, religion and ethics at the University of Nottingham and author of Theology and Social Theory. Thanks to our moderator, Scott Stevens, online editor of the ABC Religion and Ethics website.